Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Glenn Fisher. I am the vice president of the Book and Author Society, and I am delighted to welcome author Daniel Black with us tonight to talk about his book, Don't Cry For Me. Yeah. So uh, before we get going, I just want to give you all a little um, idea of how tonight's event's going to run. Uh, we're currently also streaming this live to Facebook as well. So those of you watching us there, welcome. Um, we're, we're hoping your experience is good. It is Facebook. So let's hope for the best. Um, so tonight we're going to chat for a little bit and then we're going to uh, answer your questions that you can enter right now. You don't have to wait until the Q&A section. You can enter them right now on your device using the Q&A function. Just go ahead and put in your question there. And then if you see a question that you uh, would like answered, go ahead and upvote it. There's a little thumbs up uh, button on your device. And that helps our other member, Sarah Andrus, our secretary at the Book and Author Society. She can sort those and figure out which ones we need to prioritize if that's the case. So. Uh, that's how you can interact with us tonight. And um, this event is going to be recorded and available on our YouTube channel for viewing afterwards. And you will get a uh, post attendee survey. Please fill that out because it helps us bring more authors like Daniel to you in the future and helps us improve our, our uh, events like this. Uh, there's some really good stuff coming in the future for the Book and Author Society. And uh, you can find out by subscribing to our newsletter so that you're the first to know. And also um, you can buy a book, copy of Daniel's book. Uh, we, we really just want you to buy the book, frankly, uh -huh. just buy it wherever, even yeah. if you just want to uh, buy, get it from your local public library. That's great, read this book. It's really worth your time. But we also want to support our independent bookstores and booksellers out there. So we've set up a uh, link for our bookshop.org store. So you can see all of the authors that we've got coming for you this winter. And you can purchase their books there. Uh, but wherever you want, you go ahead, you get that book. Because we, want you to, we don't want you to miss this story. So um, if you have any other questions, then um, please feel free to put that into the Q&A now and we'll, we'll get to that a little later today. So with that, thank you so much, Daniel Black, for uh, joining us tonight and uh, sharing with us, Don't Cry For Me. I finished this book in two days, wow. which is remarkable for me because I am uh, not the fastest reader, but this was just such a delight. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you. And Glenn, thank you for having me. And everyone, thank y'all for joining us. This is just fantastic. I'm just having a ball with this book. I'm loving how it's touching people. I'm loving how it's circulating in America. I'm loving all the ways that this book is bringing people together and initiating healing. It's just a fan fantastic moment. So thank you for having me, Glennie. I can't wait to get into this discussion. Well, <clears throat> with that, um, the, th the first thing that I really appreciated about this book was the author's note at the very beginning that helps oh, yes. set things. Would you like to say anything about that? Because that was really helpful to me. Yes. You know, I, I wrote the author's note after I had written the novel. So I wrote the author's note last. And I wrote the author's note because I wanted people to understand that though this is a book of fiction, yes, but what it but it absolutely reflects the real life tension that so many of us go through dealing with our fathers. So many people, black, white, male, female, trans, trans, fluid, etc. Just there's just tension in the land right around fathers and fatherhood and how fathers treat mm -hmm. children and what kind of ways that you know we wish our fathers had shown up for us and the ways that we wanted intimacy glenn and the ways that we dreamed about vulnerability from our daddies for so many of us and it just never happened but also the scars that left 
and the ways in which as adults we are still trying to mend and to and to heal and to deal with those scars and to and so this book i pray is me offering an, an olive branch between generations right so that fathers can know that children have been waiting for their heart that's really all children really want. We want to know who daddy is. Daddy, it was wonderful that you fed us. We needed to eat. It was wonderful that we had shelter. We couldn't have lived without it. But the thing we really wanted, right, is, daddy, who are you? What do you think? What do you feel? What, what makes you weep, you know? Um, and we've been waiting on daddy's heart a long time. And so I would really tell fathers, take a deep breath and give your heart away. That's the healing thing. See, that's exactly right. I mean, that's that's very powerful. And your relation, a person, a man's, particularly a, a gay man's relationship right. with his father is very different from when he was a child to when he's an adult. And that dynamic completely changes. So um, that's, it's really nice to see that advice for fathers particularly to, co to come out but that author's note was just so useful to setting the tone for the book for me so look everyone listening please don't skip over the author's notes or those any of the other stuff at the beginning of a book because it really does help set the tone for your your reading the author put it there for a reason so please don't skip it but um, the format of this book was just so good. I wasn't sure what to expect, even right. though I read, you know, the the reviews and the blurbs and all that. Right. Um, and the the f format of the letters, mm -hmm. like writing letters, letters that really didn't get answered. That's right. The, it's a one sided conversation. That's right. And I thought that was just such a really interesting. Uh, way of telling this story. How did you come up with that? Because in, in this case, I wanted more perspective than point of view, mm. right? I wanted the father to have center stage, right? And I wanted the father to be uninterrupted. I wanted the daddy to be on display for all practical purposes for the entirety of this narrative. I wanted the daddy also for the first time in his life to understand his significance and his power, right? His, his, his worth, right? To really understand the authority that he had in the and still has in the middle of his hands, right? And to understand that, that, that what he does with this will breed life or death for his son. You know, and um, I guess I may as well just go ahead and tell you and, and the rest of America too. Um, the the son's response. I'm halfway through it, right? So Isaac writes his own series of letters back to his father, right? I'm halfway through. Oh my God, it's killing me. It's just it's just the most poignant kinds of. Oh my God, just unbelievable. But for now. I wanted this book to really be centered upon Jacob because I wanted Jacob to pour his heart out without hesitation. I wanted him to, to, to absolutely take the time to really explore and examine the depths and the contours of what he's never ever said out loud. And quite frankly, I wanted a poor black disenfranchised black man to reign as king for a moment. Right. And to really understand that who he is and what he is has value and it has worth, you know, and I wanted him to, to to admit to himself that he wounded his son, though in his heart he loved him and he wanted to love him. But also, and I think this is so important, Glenn, to, for him to admit also that he came from an era, E-R-A, and, and a time in which what his son was asking of him was, was generationally impossible. His son was asking him to understand, to comprehend, to conceptualize what a black gay boy needed in the 1960s. And his father's, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Because what does it mean 
for a boy to love a boy? Like, what is that? Who does that? How do you how do you do that? Is that even right? Like, does God even consider that? Like, what the hell is this? And I wanted to show America too that as comfortable as many people are now with fluidity, right? With you know, what's your pronouns? You know, all of this, uh, who, which is beautiful and wonderful, wonderful in terms of inclusion of difference. Just a generation ago, and I mean just a generation ago, people had no notions of these ideas whatsoever. And part of the reason, Glenn, is because this black boy, Jacob, who grows up in rural Arkansas, America had absolutely dismissed his intellectual growth, had, had no investment whatsoever in growing him as a spirit, in growing him as a citizen of this country. America literally dismissed and threw him away. And then he becomes an adult, right? And all of a sudden now, we want a thinking, functioning, um, cosmopolitan kind of spirit. And Jacob is trying to tell his son, son, nobody gave me the tools mm -hmm. to construct what it is you needed from me. I would have given it to you had I had it, had I known even where to find it. It was outside of his conceptual realm. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's really powerful. And, um, that that actually comes through very clearly in this book as you're reading through it and it just it several times i i got kind of heart punched you know mm. and <laughs> i think that was the intent <laughs> but um mostly because there are so many tensions between father and son that a lot of fathers and sons um have right now and while things have improved i think people are a little more comfortable with it it's not there's still a long way to go there's a long way to go certainly so, so that's, and, and that's important because in many circles especially in academic circles etc it can seem like this concept is so remarkably evolved right and in a few places that's true but the truth of the matter is in the general terrain of the land right there is much work yet to be done and the point is not trying to get people to, 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 to deem sexuality their preference or try to deem sexuality right. The point really is to, can someone be different from you without being abused by you? That's really, that's, that's the press. Can they be different whether you like it or you don't? Whether you agree or you don't, whether you think they're going to hell or not. Must they be abused by you because you don't see the worth or the value of that existence. Because see, that's at the seat, Glenn, of racism in this country. The point of racism is that you treat someone differently because they're different. Mm -hmm. That's the cornerstone of racism. And so racism and homophobia and misogyny all have their seed in the same thing. And that is the notion that if when people find something different, they think they have to fight it. Rather than embrace or understand. Or just let it exist. Coexist, yeah, that that's a really, really good point. I I see. So I don't want to get like super personal, but there have been tensions like that with me and my father. Yes, sir. and then I think of roles as I was reading through this book because they're so personal. These letters yes, are yes, so personal. Yes, sir. I start thinking about like what is my role with other young people in my life not yes. just family right but with other young people that i encounter because i'm a librarian and we encounter young folks all the time and particularly lgbtq folks right they um see the library as a safe space right and so they come and they talk to us and they want to be heard and they want to have shelter from the abuse <laughs> so i always think about my role in that and and this book addresses that topic too and really makes you think about your role i mean it did me um that's what i one of the many things i took away from your book absolutely yes sir and you know and i think one of the things that i do attempt to do here glenn is to really demonstrate the price isaac pays for being black and gay in the 60s right 
And the truth of the matter is the price any child paid for being gay in the 60s. Again, I think of these young people now and thank God, thank God, thank God, they have the kind of world, right, wherein they can declare their sexuality, you know, in, in high school, you know, or they can walk the earth in, in, in a, um, a rainbow colored t-shirt, or they can, you know, they can tell their parents, this is who I am. And if you don't like it, it doesn't matter. This world is new. You know, those same declarations 30 years ago would get people put out of the house, literally would get people killed. Those exact same manifestations 30, 40 years ago would absolutely positive, have gotten kids sent to concentration camps in America mm -hmm. where, where they put kids through electric shock therapy, trying to literally shock the gay out of you. Like this is very real. You know, yep. and so I want I want young people to understand that this freedom, right? This 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 uh, fluidity, the beauty of this these wings that they uh, fly around the earth with. Someone paid for those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And I just need people to know that this this book has so many great great themes and, and discussion points like uh, Black history. I mean, you've touched on that, Absolutely. but also the tensions between rural versus urban settings Absolutely. or academic and that, that whole piece. And exactly. we're seeing some of that. We're seeing that now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's very important in this book because Jacob as a country boy, part of the problem is that he moves to an urban space. He moves mm -hmm. to Kansas City and Kansas City asks things of him that the country never would, right? Kansas City asks for a kind of evolved psyche. Kansas City asks, are you a reader? Kansas City, you know, there are bookstores, you know? And of course he marries a, girl, um, a young lady from there and she loves nothing more than reading. Mm -hmm. And so he steps into this literate space, although he stepped out of literally an illiterate space in terms of the way in which he had constructed himself. Right. And what most, most people don't realize, too, is contemporary ideas like um, feminism, right, contemporary ideas like LGBT, etc. These are really academically manufactured and academically pressed notions. Average everyday people, average ev and certainly poor black folks in the country never got invited into these conversations. Mm -hmm. Never got invited into these constructions. No one ever thought that some black woman in the South, right, needed to be part of what it meant to um, 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 to discover feminism, right? These were folks in urban spaces. These were college educated women who passed this notion then on, right? And I'm saying this because it's really, really important to understand because this text is black history in so many ways that we were asking and have, and have been asking something of black people and even more specifically black parents because a, a magical thing happened in the 60s and that is the thing called integration. For the first time ever, black kids started going to school with white kids, right? So the ideas then started to get transferred. And so notions that black kids had never dealt with before, had never brought home before, now are on their way. But those black parents did not get invited into the kind of education, educational reservoir that white parents had experienced. So all of a sudden now black children want Ward Cleaver as their father. All of a sudden now we want Leave It to Beavers, uh, you know, Leave It to Beavers there. We want the Brady Bunch's father, right? Uh, and it's not who we can get and it's not who we can have. You know, even in the 70s when, when um, not 70s, uh, the 90s when um, Bill, Bill, Bill Cosby comes along, Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's in an urban space. It's in New York. Right. And and so so this notion of how in the world did poor, disenfranchised rural parents deal with sexuality difference is a humongous issue, which is why so many kids from there leave there. Mm -hmm. That's true. I uh, I really and, and I we still see that. Yeah, I mean that's that's uh, reflected in. A, I work in a smaller, more suburban, rural library, so it is 
it, I see a lot of that tension. Right. So it another thing that just really hit home. And then, of course, for me, being a librarian, just this importance of reading coming through in the book was just heartwarming, but also just very interesting to me about how he, Jacob valued reading and wished that he could have read more, that he had that educational background. Mm -hmm. Which, and, and I do want to say something about that, Glenn, because this mm -hmm. is important. See, from the time Africans arrived on the shores of America enslaved, right? Africans began to discover then, and certainly understood all throughout the 18th and 19th century, that the key to Black survival and Black thriving in America, the key to what would be the difference in terms of our understanding of freedom and our notion of a kind of life and lifestyle, right, that would be satisfactory to us, the difference would be knowledge, not wealth, right? The difference would be knowledge, not power, right? The different, and in fact, knowledge is power. Right. And so we come from people who understood that if you could read, you could construct your own identity. You could construct your own world. Right. Which is why so many folks in the 18th and 19th century went out of their way to make sure African people could not read, which is why reading was even illegal in so many places. Right. So reading is not just leisure activity for black folks. Leisure was reading was life or death. And so when you what's so interesting is to get to a place now where you get generations of people, black people who sometimes, especially black youth, who sometimes don't even want to read. It's an unbelievable insult unto the historiography and into the legacy of what it has meant to be black in this country and the absolute dire means by which our ancestors fought and died for the right to read. And so when Jacob comes along, right, Jacob is part of this history of folks who were never allowed to read. And, you know, he says, my grandfather, I don't think could could read at all. You know, my grandmother could a little, but, uh, but just barely. And so they had the dream of somebody going to school, which is why Jacob gets to go as far as the eighth grade. And this is funny because compared then to his grandfather who raised him, Jacob went to school a long time, right? <laughs> And yep. so when Isaac graduates from high school, oh my God. And then he goes to college. But see, people don't understand that what it, what it took for a poor black uneducated man to send a son to college when he barely had finished the eighth grade. That is an achievement most colossal. But it seems very small <laughs> because people take now reading for granted. Yep. But reading meant life or death for black people in this country. Wow. That's that's so <laughs> so important. Wow. I, I as I was reading through this book, it it struck me that like Jacob is not a reader. He's not he's he's not a well-educated man. That's right. And his letters are just so beautiful and impactful. So like did he, as he's writing these letters to Isaac, is he, are these letters coming out so beautifully because of his experiences? I'm just curious, like, how did a, somebody who... These letters are coming out because remember, in fact, it's kind of a full circle. He doesn't start writing them until he had been reading for 20 years. Remember, he, Got it. he's writing them on his deathbed. But by this point, he's been reading for 20 years, right? And, and so his facility with language has multiplied. He, he, he's learned words. He's, you know, he spent all these years doing that. He's telling it in real time so that Isaac is, is walk, he's walking Isaac through his history, right? But he's actually writing the letters at the end of his life. That is, that's a really important note. Um, I saw, uh, I saw that as I was reading through that. I really want to know what books he read because his letters came out so beautifully and they were um, moving. Like he has, he has a facility with language, his talent there yeah. and really can condense a lot of feeling into the letters to his son. Yeah. And I only hope, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next book. I'm hoping that the response from Isaac recognizes that i'm just i'm i can only imagine the kind of uh uh pressure 
that you're under trying to write oh my things God. from Isaac's side of the thing. It's got to be just so hard. Yes. So um, what else should our audience know about this book? I think our audience should know there are two things I think that just really stand out in my head, right? And that is the role of music in this book, the role mm -hmm. of music in, in the Black community. To understand that music in some ways was the language Black people held on to, even when having not been invited into the literary world or into the tradition of, of, of literacy in this country. Um, church, you know, the church did its part in terms of music. Um, the juke joints do their part in terms of music, but music is, is, is the medium by which folks get to purge. It's the medium by which people get to heal, right? It's the means by which people know God. It's the means by which people come to understand, you know, who God is and, and, and how God functions. Um, and it's very important to understand that Isaac is a man who, I mean, not, Jacob is a man who loves music. He always has, right? He was he was not a singer. He wasn't a musician, but he loves music. And the irony upon all ironies is that he births a child so talented, right, who also loves music and loves art and loves. And and the irony, he and he and his son are so much alike. But J Jacob is so afraid of his heart that he cannot see mm -hmm. how he cannot see their alignment because he is so afraid of his heart. And Isaac is one who lives in the center of his, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's one thing that readers should know. I think another thing that readers should know is that, uh, uh, is that Jacob, Jacob attempts to do a very dangerous thing. And that is Jacob attempts to say, for all practical purposes, Isaac, you'll have to teach me You'll have to heal me if this if this relationship is going to be sustained. In other words, kind of metaphorically, you'll have to be the father. Mm -hmm. In this instance, I'm the son. I'm the student because I messed this up so badly. I wounded you so terribly. I wounded you beyond my capacity to heal you. And so if there will ever be something between us, if we will have any kind of bond whatsoever, I'll need you to help me. <sighs> That is, that is, that's part of what really, that was one of the many heart punches that I got from this book. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because regret, a lot of regret, like, right. why didn't I respond or why didn't I take action? Yeah. Um, those of us who have lost a parent have that no matter what, no matter who you are, when you lose a parent you all, or a loved one, you always wonder, like, if, if the relationship was a damaged one, what could have been? What could have been, that's right. And uh, the other part of this book that really sp speaks to me is, um, it's, a, it's a personal anecdote that I used to be uh, uh, an academic librarian at a private uh, university. And they had a program that addressed that, that went out and got young black men mm. specifically who couldn't go to college normally and brought them into college right. on, on scholarship and gave, got them a degree, an undergraduate degree. And they came to the library and I got to work with them. And um, one of the cohorts was, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. Oh, wow. And an, an incredible number of the group were yes. gay men mm -hmm. gay black men and they came to the library because again we were a safe space and right. i got to work with them and a lot of them were in the area that i was liaison to and your book as i'm reading that i'm thinking oh my goodness that <laughs> that's what oh, another reason why another perspective on why that work is so important that's right because they didn't have that opportunity and that's right and it was it it un, it made me understand why when I was mentoring some of these young men, I, a couple of them just broke down and cried, oh, and absolutely. they they said nobody's ever done anything like this for me before, and I just didn't. It just really punched me in the gut. Absolutely, and and, and Glenn, that's important because 
the power of reading, the power of reading is that it allows one, it invites one into an imaginative reality that has not yet come to pass. The beauty of reading, the beauty of writing is that we get to create the world that does not yet exist. Mm -hmm. We get to make what we know is possible. And we get to plant that seed, right, in reality, right? Mm. And so it's, it, it, it's so important to understand that Jacob discovers that what he missed all those years reading is that he was stuck in reality. He was stuck in the world as he knew it. He didn't know that you could dream something different and actually bring it to pass. Mm -hmm. You know, Jacob had lived an entire life of obedience, not creativity. And so he realizes that, oh my God, this is what my son has wanted. My son wanted another kind of man. My son wanted an evolved father. My son wanted a father who could, who could imagine him as a man too, although he looked nothing like his, his own daddy, right? Mm -hmm. But it takes reading. It takes reading and writing. It takes knowledge to get to the place where you can construct the unknown and the unseen. And by the time Jacob gets to his deathbed, he realizes, right, that only reading, only books gave him the tools whereby to, to, to envision and to imagine himself bigger and more evolved than he is. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was, that was fantastic. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of Q&A. Yes. So I'm going to let Sarah take over for a little bit. Okay. And if you still, if you guys have more cute uh, questions, please keep typing. Oh, and they're still coming in. Thank you, Dr. Black, for being here today. This is so great. And thank you to all of our guests today. This is one of the most active Q and A's I've seen in a while. Please I'm just going to say coming. a lot of these people are my brothers and my sisters and my friends. And I have the absolutely most amazing, the most electrifying community. I really, really, really do. Some of these are, are my own folks and they are just priceless. That's a, such a compliment to you and to all of the people that you brought here today. We're again, so happy to have you here. I will start reading from the Q&A now. Make sure you get your questions in. It is not too late, but we will start. Um, our most upvoted question today, and if, if if it is a spoiler for your next book, we do not have to answer it. So, um, Sydney asks, what do you think Isaac's response would have been if Jacob had made it to Chicago to visit him? It was so painful each time Jacob got so close to opening up to Isaac, but instead he held back. Ah, I'm trying to figure out how not to spoil the, the reading for someone, but but I'm going to answer that this way. One of the most poignant parts of this book was that part right there. And so I don't know who asked, who asked that question, but that, that anecdote literally brought me to tears because it's literal and it's metaphorical that his father is on the way to him, but he never quite gets there. But he is on the way. And see, being on the way has to mean something. It's got to register as significant. It can't be a total failure just because he didn't get you know, he didn't make it the entire way. And so the thing I will say about this is the celebration, the joy, the achievement is the journey. It's not necessarily if daddy arrived. It's the fact that he wanted to come. It's the fact that in his heart, he was trying to put away enough of his own limitations in order to make his way to his son. Oh my God, just, I mean, how beautiful that this old man is saying, I, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, you know? And a try is valuable. It is, you know, and all of us as human beings, there are times when we tried and we didn't necessarily achieve or succeed totally, but to say that we did nothing would be incorrect. And that's true of this father too. That is that is so true. And sometimes your best is just your best. And that's right. That is him trying. That's right. That's absolutely right. Thank you, Sydney Kearns, for that excellent question. Next, we have uh, Sean asking, would this book be made into a feature film? And if it is, um, do you how do you think people will react to it? You know, I've thought about that. Of course, it's, it's only been out just 
um, you know, like two weeks now or so, right? Um, and I thought, I said, oh, wow, if, if this went to the screen, what would I think about it? I think it would be really a beautiful, beautiful film if done correctly. I also think it would be enormously, enormously emotional. I, you know, I, I just think there's just no way to get around that. I think it would be really, really, really a tearjerker. Oh, definitely. And I was talking with my mother-in-law earlier who, this is one of the first books she's read in a little bit and she was crying after it. Wow. I don't wow. think you can get away from this being an emotional read and seeing it on the screen would, wow. wow. <laughs> Next we have, sorry, my second screen is far away. Um, I see that you narrated, this is another Sarah, great name. I see that you narrated the audiobook as well, and I also listened to the audiobook. How was that for you? Grueling. <sighs> <laughs> Let me say, it was. I'm glad I did it. It was an amazing experience, amazing experience. I just did not know the amount of work that is. I mean, it's not just reading the book and then you're done. You, it's reading and rereading and rereading and rereading. Oh, my God. Oh my, and, and some pages you read 20 times because, because the voice is not right, the inflection is not there, you know, oh my God. Um, so it was really a grueling process. I would do this one again, for sure, for the experience. I wondered if going forward, I want to do more of them. I haven't quite made up my mind yet, but it was definitely a grueling process. Also, I hear these voices in my head in terms of these characters. So I wanted to represent their voices the way I heard it in my head. So, so I was doing lots of switching of tones and tonalities, et cetera. And so I hope I did a pretty good job. Oh, I loved it. I thought it was very successful. If I get a vote, I would love to have you do the next one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that. Because I also, I read and I, I read, read it in paper and then I also listened. Uh -huh. So I kind of flip flop back and forth. Okay. And okay. Where, where I needed to hear the voice, I thought I would listen to yours uh, narrate it. So thank you for doing that. Absolutely. I'm also curious, did you do it in a sound studio or did you I do did. it in? Okay. I did. I did it in the studio. Yep. Cool. We had a follow-up question come from a KN Henry on audiobooks. <laughs> did reading the book um, create a shift in how you'll approach the follow-up? Yes. And, and KN Henry, I love you. Uh, that's my brother. Re yes. You know, ironically, Recording the book forced me to read it slowly and to really digest parts that I hadn't quite digested fully before because I'm reading it slow and over and over and over. By the time I got to the end, I loved this book probably more than I did even when I submitted the manuscript. But there were things in this book that I said, you know, when Isaac responds, he's got to respond to that or he must respond to this. I got clearer about that by doing the audio. Yes. You got to be an author and a reader. That's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. Uh, we have another question that says, I've read the book and have spoken with others about, um, about it who have also read it, which is super impressive. It has not been out very long. It hasn't. Um, are you getting feedback from any readers telling you that it feels like it's their own story being told? Oh, God, yes. Absolutely. In fact, I get, I get messages every single day, literally on either Facebook, Instagram, lots and lots of Instagram messages. Uh, you know, it's a book of the month selection and that has been just fantastic. And I've gotten messages from um, folks of every race, every gender, literally. And everybody's saying, this is my story. This has been my story. It's, I mean, and I've, that's been so heartwarming. Even, I must say, girls in terms of their relationship with their fathers. Um, and it has really helped me to see that there's something we need to tease out as a nation in terms of patriarchy. It's not doing us the favors we think as men. It is absolutely positively not contributing unto the beauty of family and nation um, that people once imagined. There are ways that we're wounding people all over this nation and we don't know it. And in some instances, I think we absolutely don't mean to, but it's still true. And so the answer to that is absolutely. People are telling me everywhere that this is my story. Oh my God, I wept because I, I, I wish my father would have said some of these things. Absolutely. That 
is such a powerful, it, it's so cool that people have been able to reach out to you yes. and have those kind of moments as well. Yes. And everybody who reaches out, I try my best to respond to every single person. Oh, you're a hero. It's a lot. <laughs> We have another question from Sydney. What do you think Jacob would say to his own father who abandoned him? And would he be able to have any sympathy for his grandfather who did not have the ability to do better because he was not given the opportunity to experience the world that Jacob was growing into? You know, my, my honest truth is I'm not quite sure what Jacob would say to his own father, but I do think what he would say to his grandfather, right? Because he has an emotional tie to his grandfather. I think he would tell his grandfather, I forgive you too. Because he realized that he did what his granddaddy did. Which was the exact opposite of what he meant. And what I think Jacob discovers is, can a man actually do the opposite of what he intends? Absolutely. When there's distance between your heart and your head, you'll fall somewhere in between. Yes. Um, next up, I have a question from Tracy. And I think based off of your author's note and how real this book feels, I think some of us are wondering how autobiographical it is. She's wondering, was Rachel in any way based on your own mother? Um, in some ways, yes. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Uh, and part of the, that, that, that truth is because I only knew my mother very, very vaguely. Literally, I knew my mother for about a week in my life. Um, long story, but I never, I, did, I didn't grow up with my birth mother and I never knew her. We did, there was no phone calls, no visits, no cards, nothing. It's as if she didn't exist. And then one day she appeared and 10 days later she died. So that, that's as long as I knew her. But uh, I, I did meet her family and they told me many things. And some of the things they told me about her are wrapped up in Rachel's nature. So absolutely, absolutely. And in some ways, Rachel is the mother I think I dreamed and I wanted. Yeah. Was that a powerful experience for you? I, I mean, you write in the author's note that this is the letters that you would never get and then being able to put the mother that you did not have into this as well. Absolutely, and a very powerful experience. Because again, what I discovered is that the power of writing is that you get to fill in your own gaps. You can even recreate your own memory, you know, it because memory is not facts. <laughs> Mem memory is the way you put it together. Memory is the way you, you remembered it, literally the way you remembered the thing, right? And I realized that in writing, I could reconstruct my own hurt. I could reconstruct my pain. I can make people honor me who really didn't. I can make people love me who hated me. I can make folks think of me who might not have thought of me at all, you know, because I get to, I get to make myself safe, you know, in my own literary space. So uh, yeah, it was, it, it was definitely a powerful experience. And what a gift to be able to do that. And with your, your creative voice, that is such a gift to us as well. I appreciate that. Thank you. I am not just flattering you. You're my favorite book of the year so far. <laughs> I thank you. I really do. I'm so honored. I really, really am. We have several more questions, so I'm going to keep trucking on. <laughs> okay. Um, how close are you to completing now, Isaac's response to Jacob? Um, Rosemary can't wait to read it. And I will tackle on, are you working on anything else other than Jacob's response? I know you've written other things in the past. It's probably Rosemary. Is it Rosemary? It is definitely Rosemary. <laughs> Rosemary is my mother. So <laughs> I love, 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 love. No, honestly, that woman has saved me in ways, I'd just burst into tears if I kept talking about it. She's literally filled in gaps for me. She, she, she stood in the gap for me in ways that's just immeasurable. But um, I'm probably halfway, you know, if I, if I were not teaching this semester, I could have it done by now. But I'm teaching, which means I'm preparing lectures and grading papers, et cetera. Um, if I had a good 90 days, I could knock it out. We're so, all just hoping for that. Uh, I'm hoping I get that this summer. Yeah. yeah. 
one one day maybe you get your Harper Lee moment and someone just pays for you to write. <laughs> I hope it's coming. I hope it's coming. Fingers crossed. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, had um, Travis also asked, since you are a professor, will you turn this book into a class on how uh, you handle trauma? Oh, wow. Um, heavy hitting questions tonight. It is. These are very heavy questions. The notion of would I even turn this book into a class? You know, I don't know because people have asked me like, would you like to do a seminar in your own works? And I'm not sure I would because I think I'm just so close to these narratives and, and they're just so personal for me. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I would want it to, I would want someone to. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want it to be me. I'd love maybe to guess come in as a guest speaker and maybe a guest lecturer, but I don't know that I'd want to teach it day by day, you know, to li relive all of this, you know, um, day by day by day. Um, but also, you know, the thing about trauma that I have learned that took me a long time, but the thing about trauma I've learned is that my power to heal is greater than my traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. It always seemed as if my traumatic experiences overwhelmed me. But one day I realized hey God, that my power to heal is actually greater than my trauma. And once I realized that, I ceased being the victim of other people's behavior. It took me a long time to get there because we live in a country uh, that teaches us to lay blame at people's feet and to, and to insist that someone else participate in our healing. But the truth of the matter is that I can heal myself and have healed myself. And in fact, once I do that, who the people were who caused the pain becomes irrelevant. It becomes immaterial now. Because I'm the God of the self. Mm -hmm. It just took me a minute to get there. We have um, Kevin Anderson with not a question, only a statement, but deeply related. Dr. Black, this novel completely shifted my narrative of my life as a victim, as a fatherless child versus humanizing my father for the first time. Thank you, hashtag healing. Kevin Anderson is one of the most amazing black men I know, really seriously. He's in, he's in Houston, Texas, and he does, he does work around the healing of black folks and, and LGBT community members. And the work he's done, the seeds he's planted, the people he has healed, the lives he's touched um, is absolutely innumerable. I absolutely, I love him and I love the work that he does. And, and, and the truth of the matter is my aim is to do that same kind of work because there really is no joy in life unless your life gives joy. You know, I've discovered that. There's no joy in life unless your life gives joy. Yes. We have another question from Tracy. Sorry, I'm going super fast. They're coming oh, in super I fast. <laughs> You are all the best question. audience. Yeah. Rachel protects Isaac against Jacob's aggressive attempts to make a man out of him. Uh -huh. But when he initially tells her that he is different, she rails against him and calls Jacob to handle it. Why was uh, this loving mother unable to accept uh, these things about her son? Because it's not true that because a mother is protective and because a mother loves a child, that the mother also loves every aspect of that child's difference. That's not always true at all. And it's not true that only fathers often have railed against um, son's sexuality. That's not true either. And also mothers more than fathers can distinguish between a different child and a gay child. Mm -hmm. Right? Very often my mothers are like, you know, yes, be different, baby, be yourself. That's not them saying, if you're gay, I'm fine. They're not saying that, right? And I wanted to actually show that distinction because that distinction often has come as a shock to some children, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to think that mama was an ally in every single way. That's not necessarily true. But, it, it, but, but what also is true is to understand that even in that, even when she, uh, uh, um, she showed that, that she did not approve, what is true, is the wings of protection that she always kept around him. She did not move those, right? She didn't take those away from him. So that somebody can love you and be protective and still disagree. Well, I'm running out of time for questions, but um, 
something that we have not gotten to in all of our uh, wonderful conversation tonight has uh, been your writing process. Mm. Sydney asks, what's your writing process like? And what would you tell someone who dreams of writing a book? Ah, well, my writing price process, I write every day. I typically write every single day. Uh, when I'm teaching, sometimes I'll take a break because I'm grading papers, et cetera. But when I'm in writing mode, I write three, four, five hours a day. Oh, absolutely. Every, I'm so impressed. Every, if not, I just never get it done. I'm a, I'm a disciplined writer in that sense. Um, sometimes it's, it's the time I write, and sometimes it's the number of pages. Like I can, I never get more than five pages in a day, never. I don't care if I write 10 hours, I never get more than five pages in a day. These people who write 20 and 25 pages a day, I'm so envious. I never get more than five pages in a day. There are days where I can write five hours and I get one paragraph. I'm, because, just because like the rhythm, the cadence, it, I'm like I want it right. I'm also not one of those writers who can just write just any old thing and just go on and then I'll come back later. It has to be right to me in the moment. So, so I edit and write and I'm my own editor, right? So I edit and write and I do all of that, you know, s -s simultaneously. So we are not finding any messy first drafts from you. <laughs> no, I don't like that. I don't like. So the thing I would say to anyone who is a burgeoning writer, the thing I would say is learn grammar. Learn the rules, learn the craft, learn the signposts of the discipline. And then you can learn how to obfuscate them. You know, you, you can learn how to transplant them, you know, et cetera. But you cannot violate a rule that you don't know. Right. That's called a wreck, you know. And so I would definitely tell people to learn the craft. Don't just have a good story to tell. Tell it well. I think that's very important because I think that also honors people who buy your work. Make people believe that they're important enough to give you well written work. Yeah. It's like, you know, in a restaurant, you want the food to taste good, but you also want it to look good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we've all had the experience where people say, oh, this is really delicious. I know it looks horrible. And most of us are like, uh, no, thank you. It, it really might taste well, but, but most of us won't know it because it's, it, it, it's so repugnant to the eye, you know. And so I think it's important to tell a good story. I think it's important to have a good story. I think it's important to present it excellently. Um, a question that we seem to usually get is what are you reading? And since you were just talking about learning your craft, what are you going to recommend to all oh, of our Lord. viewers today? You know, I'm a person who reads, I'm a person who reads multiple books simultaneously all the time. I'm never reading one book. I'm always reading four or five books just as a rule. But you got to get through them all. Right. <laughs> you know, um, I'm reading Toni Morrison's uh, essay collection. Uh, I'm trying to remember the title of it now. I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but it's her, her latest essay collection. Um, I'm rereading Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates, mm -hmm. by, a great book. Uh, I'm always reading something by Marilyn Robinson. She's one of my absolute favorites. Oh, I love, love, love Marilyn Robinson. Gilead, I could read over and over and over just nonstop continuously, right? Um, and what else am I reading? Oh, I'm reading a lot of August Wilson's plays. Oh. That are really very, very beautifully written. Yeah, I'm teaching a class on him, so I'm reading a lot of his stuff. Um, let me see, one more thing. What else am I, uh, let me just look around and I can, oh, I'm reading the, auto, the, the biography of Frederick Douglass by David Blight, you know, the big thick one. Uh, the new book, one? Yes. Yeah, and it's really very, very, very exciting, yeah. Oh, very cool. I just bought that for, I'm also a librarian. I just bought that for our collection and I'm ah, waiting for it to come in. Yes, 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 yes. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, that takes us almost to the hour. I'm going to hand you back to Glenn for any I, last I, questions. Yes, I did. There was one that's been, uh, that I'm interested in. It said um, to ask about the title. So how did you come about the title? And I'm curious if there's a uh, story behind this beautifully illustrated cover. Isn't that cover gorgeous? So good. Just so good. You know, every time I look at this, I say, oh my God, look at that cover. I've just, just, just so absolutely gorgeous. Um, the first thing though, this question, um, 
of Don't Cry For Me. How did I come up with the title? You know, I was writing this book and very, and it's always true for me that I start the book before I ever know the title. That's always true for me. Very often what's true for me is that the title won't come until the entire book is done. <sighs> right. This one, I got all the way to like the last page or two. And when the daddy said, um, um, whatsoever you do, don't cry for me. I said, there it is. Yeah, that there it is. <laughs> because, because the title is the request from the father to the son to say, don't spend any emotional energy on me if you can help it, because I don't deserve that. I didn't give you that. I didn't mm -hmm. love you enough to deserve to deserve your tears. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, oh, but but the way Isaac responds to that, oh, you're going to love that. You're going to <laughs> absolutely love that the way he responds literally to that title. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Yes, very yes, much. Absolutely. And we hope to have you back to discuss it. I would love that. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, I wanted to say uh, that I agree with so many of the comments. We get some people that comment and don't. It's not a question. It's a comment in our Q&A. Yeah. And we get so many in, in here who say just what a fabulous writer you are oh and how much they really appreciate all of your work. And I got to just echo that. Oh, this wow has been an honor and a pleasure, Dr. Black. Thank you. It's been an honor for me. It really has. And Glenn, I want to thank you both for reading the book. And I want to thank you for being open to the ways in which um, it took you and your own life as well. I really, really appreciate that testimony. And my prayer is that this book will do healing work all over this nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I uh, want to thank all of our viewers who joined us tonight, any of our Facebook viewers too, hopefully it worked. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to let you know that the Book and Author Society is having a Bryn Turnbull on March 21st at 7 p.m., that's a Monday, here on Zoom again. And her, she's gonna be talking about her newest book, The Last Grand Duchess. Then we have another author coming in April, Jane Green, who's going to talk to us about her book, Sister, Sister Stardust. Mm. Both of those events are uh, available on our website now for registration. Please feel free to go and register now. You'll get reminders as we get closer to that date. Get a copy of the book. And um, thanks again for being here. We really appreciate you.